the Brahmajala Sutta, or the Discourse on the All-Embracing Net of Views, is the first discourse of the Buddha presented in the Tripitaka, the ancient collection of early Buddhist scriptures. These scriptures were memorized and transmitted orally from the time of the Buddha, and were committed to palm leaves in the first century BCE. The Brahmajala Sutta is one of the thirty-four long discourses, which are collectively called Digha Nikaya. In the text, the Buddha describes a number of philosophical and speculative views concerning the self and the world that were prevalent among spiritual seekers of his day. In rejecting these teachings, he establishes the parameters of his own position via negation. That is to say, the Buddha wants to show that the ultimate truth is not a speculative viewpoint. We proceed now with a simplified abridgment of the text. The Exalted One and his company of bhikkhus were travelling with a wanderer named Supiya and his pupil Brahmadatta. Supiya spoke badly about the Buddha while Brahmadatta praised him. They continued to contradict each other as they entered the royal rest house. The next morning the bhikkhus discussed how the Exalted One had understood the different dispositions of beings, considering the opposite opinions of Supiya and Brahmadatta. He said, when others speak in dispraise or praise of me, the Dharma or the Sangha don't become angry or jubilant. Instead, examine the truth of their statements and respond accordingly. If false, point out the falsehood, and if true, acknowledge it. Worldlings only refer to trifling and insignificant matters of mere moral virtue when speaking in praise of the Tathagata. They might say that the Buddha abstains from harm, stealing, sex, lying, or slander. They might say that the Buddha abstains from damaging seed and plant life, engaging in frivolous chatter, or scheming for personal gain. Or they might say that the Buddha abstains from earning his living by wrong means of livelihood, such as predicting the future based on omens, divining by means of signs, or performing debased arts. Yet these minor details of moral virtue are what a worldling might praise the Tathagata for. However, the Tathagata propounds deep and sublime teachings that are difficult to comprehend. Wise individuals understand these teachings, and those who speak of them rightly praise the Tathagata. These teachings go beyond reasoning, and are comprehensible only to the wise. Now, concerning the speculators about the past, there are honourable recluses and Brahmins who hold settled views and assert various conceptual theorems about the past, the question arises, what is the basis for their speculations? For example, there are Brahmins who are eternalists and assert that the self and the world are eternal. Some base their views on recollecting their past lives through deep concentration and reflection, while others base their views on their rational investigations and reasoning. They believe that the self and the world are unchanging, like a mountain peak or a pillar, despite beings passing away and being reborn. The Tathagata understands these viewpoints and their consequences, but transcends them to realize perfect peace. He comprehends the origin and cessation of feelings, and finds emancipation from clinging. His profound and sublime truth, known only to the wise, is propounded by the Tathagata through direct knowledge. It is this subject matter that one rightly praises the Tathagata, in accordance with reality. There are also honourable Brahmins that are eternalists regarding some things, but non-eternalists regarding others. They proclaim that the self and the world are partly eternal, and partly non-eternal, based on four grounds. In the first case, they believe there is a time when this world contracts. Then, as the world expands, beings re-arise in the empty palace of Brahma, dwelling there for an extended time. Dissatisfaction arises, and they yearn for companionship, and other beings eventually join them in the palace. The first being thinks, I am Brahma, the great Brahma, the creator of these beings. The subsequent beings recognize him as the creator. The first being possesses greater life, beauty, and authority. When a being takes rebirth in this world, Having recollected their preceding life, they believe that Brahma is eternal and unchanging, while they are impermanent and destined to perish. In the second case, there are gods called corrupted by play, who indulge excessively in laughter and play, leading to forgetfulness and eventual departure from their plane. 
when a being reborn in this world recollects their preceding life, they recognize that gods free from corruption are eternal and unchanging. However, as gods corrupted by play, they indulged excessively and became forgetful, resulting in their departure. Now in this world, they are impermanent and destined to perish. In the third case, there are gods called corrupted by mind, who excessively envy and harbor anger towards one another. This corruption leads to exhaustion of their bodies and minds, and they eventually pass away from their plane. When a being reborn in this world recollects their preceding life, they realize that gods free from corruption by mind are permanent and unchanging. However, as gods corrupted by mind, they indulged in excessive envy and anger, resulting in exhaustion and departure. Now in this world they are impermanent and destined to perish. In the fourth case, some honorable Brahmins hold the view that the physical senses are impermanent and subject to change, while the mind or consciousness is permanent, stable and eternal. They base their belief on reasoning, investigation and personal contemplation. Again, the Tathagata understands these viewpoints and their consequences, but he also transcends them, attaining a state of perfect peace through non-attachment. Understanding the origin and cessation of feelings, their nature and the path to liberation, the Tathagata is emancipated. This profound and subtle teaching, difficult to grasp and comprehend, is expounded by the Tathagata based on direct knowledge. Those who truly understand reality would speak in praise of this teaching. Furthermore, Brahmins hold conflicting views about the finiteness or infiniteness of the world. Some base their views on deep concentration, while others base their views on rational investigation. The Tathagata also understands these viewpoints and their implications, transcending them to attain perfect peace. These profound teachings are praised by those who understand them. When other Brahmins are questioned about certain matters, they resort to evasive and equivocative statements on four different grounds. Why do they do so? In the first case, a Brahmin lacks understanding of what is wholesome and unwholesome. Fearing false declarations, they refrain from labeling anything as such, refusing to affirm or negate anything definitively. In the second case, a Brahmin lacks understanding of what is wholesome and unwholesome, but rather fear the arising of desire, lust, hatred and aversion, and so refrain from declaring anything as such. In the third case, a Brahmin again lacks understanding of what is wholesome and unwholesome, and they fear being challenged by wise and skilled debaters, who may question their views and refute their statements. To avoid distress and obstacles, they refrain from declaring anything as wholesome or unwholesome and in the fourth case a certain Brahmin is simply dull and stupid. When questioned about various points, they respond with evasive statements and endless equivocation. They neither affirm nor deny, avoiding any definite position. This applies to questions about the existence of a world beyond, spontaneous rebirth, the consequences of actions, and the existence of the Tathagata after death. Some Brahmins proclaim the fortuitous origination of the self and the world, why do they do so? They argue that a being called a god without continued perception passes away from their plane when perception arises. After taking rebirth in this world and becoming a homeless one, through concentration and reflection, they recollect the arising of perception, but nothing prior to it. They conclude that the self and the world originate fortuitously because they didn't exist before, but now they do. Similarly, on 18 different grounds, some Brahmins speculate about the past and assert conceptual theorems about it. The Tathagata understands this and comprehends the consequences of these standpoints. These profound and subtle aspects are difficult to perceive and comprehend, yet the Tathagata has realized them and shares them with the wise. Those who truly praise the Tathagata speak about these teachings in accordance with reality. Brahmins also speculate about the future and assert various conceptual theorems about it. For instance, some Brahmins proclaim the self to survive with continued perception after death. Others claim that the self survives without continued perception, while others argue that the self survives neither with continued perception nor without it. What are the reasons for their views? These various views are based on the ideas that the self is material, immaterial, both, or neither, finite, 
infinite, both, or neither, of uniform perception, of diversified perception, of limited perception, or of boundless perception, or exclusively happy, exclusively miserable, both, or neither. The Tathagata understands these grounds, and those who truly praise the Tathagata speak about it in accordance with reality. There are also Brahmins who proclaim the annihilation of an existing being after death. What are the reasons for their views? One asserts that the self, composed of the four elements, is completely annihilated at the breakup of the body, and others deny that the self is annihilated at the breakup of the body for various reasons. A second responds that there is another self, divine and with material form, which pertains to the sense sphere and which is annihilated at death. A third responds that there is another self, divine and with material form, complete in all its limbs, which is annihilated at death. A fourth responds that there is an even deeper self that belongs to the base of infinite space, which is annihilated at death. A fifth responds that there is an even deeper self that belongs to the base of infinite consciousness, which is annihilated at death. A sixth responds that there is an even deeper self that belongs to the base of nothingness, which is annihilated at death. And finally another responds that the deepest self belongs to neither perception nor non-perception, which is sublime peace, and which is annihilated at death. All of these views the Tathagata understands, and it is concerning these that those who would rightly praise the Tathagata in accordance with reality would speak. As a final consideration, there are Brahmins who proclaim that Nirvana, the cessation of suffering, is here and now on five grounds. What are these grounds? One asserts that when the self indulges in sense pleasures, it attains supreme Nirvana here and now. Another argues that true nirvana is attained when the self, secluded from sense pleasures and unwholesome states, enters the first dhyana, characterized by thought and joy. A third argues that true nirvana is attained when the self enters the second dhyana, free from gross thoughts and filled with confidence and concentration. A fourth argues that true nirvana is attained when the self enters the third dhyana, characterized by equanimity, mindfulness and bodily happiness. And finally, another argues that true nirvana is attained when the self enters the fourth dhyana, free from both pleasure and pain, and characterized by pure mindfulness and equanimity. The Tathagata understands these matters, but he transcends them and has realized perfect peace. Understanding the origin, passing away, satisfaction and unsatisfactoriness of feelings, he is liberated through non-clinging. In conclusion, the subtle teaching expressed by the Buddha's non-attachment is this. When those Brahmins proclaim the eternal existence of the self and the world, it is merely the feeling of those who do not know and do not see. It is only the agitation and vacillation of those who are immersed in craving. Likewise, in regard to those who are partial eternalists, or who proclaim the world to be finite or infinite, or who are endless equivocators, or who are fortuitous originationists, or who speculate about the past, or who maintain a doctrine of immortality, or those who are annihilationists, or those who maintain a doctrine of nirvana here and now, or those who speculate about the future. All of these are only the feelings of those who do not know and do not see. It is only the agitation and vacillation of those who are immersed in craving. So too, when those who hold these views proclaim their grounds, they are conditioned by contact with sensation, for it is impossible to experience these feelings without contact. And that brings us to the end of the Brahmajala Sutta. If you enjoyed this adaptation, please consider subscribing to the channel with notifications on, or support us by leaving a like or comment. You can also buy me a coffee to help me make the next video like this by checking the link in the description. Thank you for listening and have a great day.